Hey everyone. Hi. Hello. Welcome to another exciting episode of Allison Rosen is your new best friend. I'm very excited to talk to my guest today. It is Esther Pavitsky. You, if you listen to my podcast, you've heard her before because she's come on before, but it's been a little while. She's a comedian, actor, writer, and producer. She hosts the podcast Glowing Up and Esther Club. You've seen her as Izzy on Dollface and Maya on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. She's also appeared on Brooklyn Nine-Nine, Love, Parks and Recreation, Last Comic Standing, Difficult People. She co-created the series Alone Together, and her hilarious comedy special, Hot For My Name, just debuted on Comedy Central. Hello. Welcome. Allison. (laughs) Oh, my God. I'm so thankful that you're having me back. I love you so much. You have the best energy in the biz. I freaking love you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, So Daniel and I watched your special, and were laughing so hard. I have known you for a long time, but I had never seen you do stand up, which is always weird when you know someone and you feel like you're like, you know, acquainted with their career. And then you realize, oh, but there's like a huge chunk of what they do, something that they have so much talent in that you've never seen. So it was just, it was so funny, so well done. Um, Yeah, I just I loved it. Thank you. That's so cool. Well, I definitely am not the kind of stand-up comedian that ever wants my friends at my shows. So you're like everyone else in my life who's just like, <laughs> we want to come see you, but you like won't tell us when and like make it secret. And so you're not alone. And it is weird. Like I've been doing it for 10 years and this is my first special. And so this is really like the intro for everyone in my life to just see a big <laughs> chunk of my stand-up. So it's been fun hearing people react to it especially there's a lot yeah no there's a lot of I guess I I guess I talk about Dave my fiance a lot and so a lot of his friends have been like really enjoying how much I make fun of him (laughs) so how did it come about because it's very unique in that it's like this hybrid of clips of you you know like a regular comedy special but then there's this whole other component of you in illinois with your family and there are the characters in it and then it's got a musical number at the end how, how did what's the story behind all of it yeah so i always like felt that if i was gonna do a stand-up special that i would really i really wanted to include other elements of me because i wanted especially this first one to feel like kind of a calling card you know this is me this is my comedic voice like here's my taste and I always felt like I had this funny dynamic with my parents and I used to periscope all the time when I was home for the holidays and people would just go crazy for my parents and my dad and like all their reactions to me and I do think it's a little bit of a unique relationship but still pretty relatable you know my parents do not think highly of me as I'm sure you saw in this special like (laughs) they just kind of are whatever about me and uh you know one point I'm in the documentary I'm like do you guys think my special be funny and my dad's just like no so I, I just always wanted that. And we pitched the idea to Comedy Central and we were lucky enough to have Adam Sandler behind us. You know, he had came on board to produce. And so when we pitched that to Comedy Central, they were immediately just like, yeah, we want to do this. We like this. We could tell mm-hmm. this is like weird and going to be something cool. And did you have a crew in your house with your parents? No. So we just had one person, our director, Nick Goosen, who he works with Happy Madison a lot. And I've known him for a while. And it was just him in his cargo shorts with a camera. And in fact, like when Comedy Central first gave us like their first budget proposal for the shoot, it it had like, you know, crew and hair and makeup and lighting and sound and stuff and we just me and nick my producing partner just wrote back we're like no we're good we don't need any of that like this is not going to be some overproduced like Mm -hmm. you know okay in this conversation now you do this and we'll get on this reaction for that no we're just like fly on the wall all day every day nick is in the corner he follows us in the car to the ice cream shop to dinner and that was really important to me because growing up, my favorite TV show of all time is The Osbournes. And The Osbournes is one of those early reality shows where 
it was really written in the edit. You know, they you could tell that they just mm-hmm. shot as much as they could, and then they kind of made the story. Whereas opposed to today, when you're seeing reality shows, it's more like okay, a producer goes in and is like, in this scene, you're gonna tell so and so that you have a crush on this person, and I hate that. Like, I would rather just watch scripted TV. So it was really important to me to like put my family in a situation where they had to for where they could forget a camera was filming you know so was that hard for them I think maybe at first but you know when it's really just one kind of goofy guy with a camera you do kind of forget especially because he became such a big part of our family like because he was there all the time you know those trips that we took and he really fit in well with my parents and, and my dad really liked him so it you know, there's times where my my dad my dad hate, hates being filmed. He he absolutely hates it, and so he would always try to get Nick to just interact in the scene, and you know, <laughs> so that was the one thing that kept happening. But otherwise, it was fine. <sighs> and then, did like did you? So you like you said you would periscope, including your parents, for a long time. Yeah. Um, In this way that is, and I mean this, I don't mean, this sounds like a judgment, it's not, but like in this kind of surprise, intrusive way to your parents, were they ever upset about that? No, they, so I used to have that security camera in my parents' living room, which I, you know, I did a bit about that on Seth Meyers, where I had bought a security camera to, to watch my dogs at night. Uh Uh-huh. And then I would like peek in and my dad would just be like in his underwear, (laughs) you know, on the couch with a newspaper over his head or my parents would be on the couch flossing together on Friday night. And it just became (laughs) this really weird thing. And the security camera like led to issues. You know, my dad would would just like scream at me about it, especially when I first asked to do it. And then like the security camera was like the drama of my, that was like the big piece of family drama because my dad is a compulsive gambler and he relapsed on gambling. And I found out because of the security camera. What did you see? This is so crazy. So one night I, I opened it up at like 3am, right. To just see my dogs. Cause I like to, I like to see them sleep on the couch. Yeah. They're always doing something funny and take a screenshot. So I log in at 3am and my dad is sitting on the couch and he has these like bags of money of cash. <laughs> and he's like counting, he's counting cash and it's like dollars. You know, it's not a ton of money. My parents are like not even they're below middle class, but so, and I was like, that's so we, I didn't, so I didn't know what that was. I, mm-hmm. that didn't strike, strike me as gambling stuff. I was just like, what the fuck? Like, did he rob a bank? Like what's happening? <laughs> right. Why bags? And, and, yeah. And I call the house and I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I just went to Coinstar. Mm. And I'm like, okay. Does it give you- and, yeah. Yeah. And then the next day I told my mom that and she's like, what? And then my mom put it together because the other clue that we had was, by the way, my dad's like 77. He's like a total scam artist, this old <laughs> scammer. The other clue was this was right around the time when like location sharing became came to iPhones. And so mm-hmm. I was really, we were all about it as like a family and all my friends in my friend circle. So I was sharing location with all my close friends. I shared it with my mom and they sh- and my parents, my sister. We all shared it with each other. But my dad's kept not working. And I'd always be like, Dad, it's his location available. But, and, and he kind of was like, I don't know. I, I set it on. I don't know. And so my mom put that together with the coin star in quotes. And she's like, oh, he's going to gamble while I'm at work and, you know, whatever it is. So we found that out basically with the help of the security camera. And he he totally came forward, too. He came clean and was like, yeah, you know, when my location wasn't working, I just used my dumb old man trick. (laughs) He's like, I don't know. I'm I'm just an old guy. I don't know how my phone works. (laughs) Um, What what game does your dad play? I think he plays... I think he plays like poker or blackjack. I don't even know. He gets, he won't talk about it in front of me unless there's like a cool young man around that he wants to impress. <laughs> so I, which is like any guy I know. So he's like so starved for like young man attention. <laughs> um, like he's obsessed with Dave, my fiance. Uh, he's always like, ask Dave if he, if he's watched the departed lately, does he remember this part of the, 
So, yeah, he wanted a son. <laughs> do you really think your parents are not that into you? I do. I think that being in show business has changed that a little. They're very excited by it. You know, when I send my mom like some free makeup, she's so happy and so excited about it. Uh, and or like the fact that I know Whitney Cummings, my mom goes crazy for. <laughs> uh, and I'm trying to think of what's impressed my dad. My dad is a little harder to impress. There's something though that he was really into recently, and I can't remember. But it's only the showbiz stuff. Like they're into me is all like it's it's like a surface. It's like not. Mm -hmm. I know they love me. I'm their kid, but I'm just they just see me as their kid. It's like, they're not that excited by it. And my, the biggest standout moment of that for me was when I was at dinner with my fiance and his parents, I met them for the first time and everything he was saying, they were laughing at. And I was like, Oh, I didn't know you like parents could like physically find their kid funny. Like is that, <laughs> I thought like parents just think their kid is like an idiot and they don't, and it was such a weird experience for me. I don't know. I mean, you're, you seem like you're such a good mom, by the way. Oh, I mean, the you. cutest kids in the world. Like, Aww. I, that face, I just like, oh, he's so <laughs> cute. Do you feel like the things I'm saying, are you like, that's so crazy because you just love your boys so, so much? I relate because I have lots of issues with my own parents. Um, so in, and if for all I know, they will watch this now that I'm putting them on YouTube. It's like easy for them. And hi, mom and dad. And I think they know, you know, we're, we're good now. But I have, you know, like anyone, I, I have gripes and I have things that I feel like I, you know, didn't get these needs met as a kid or didn't get my emotions, you know, validated or my reality validated or whatever. And so now with kids, I, there's a lot of things that um, cause me to kind of rethink my own childhood and just... Like I, it's so important that Elliot feels, it's so important to me that I'm like in tune and attuned to their emotions. And I don't know that my parents prioritize that or were able to. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I hear that it's, a lot. It's the way you handle it. It's so funny. Um, and it seems like it's very matter of fact, but is there pain behind it? No, there's really not. I'm really just happy that we're all cool and things are good. And, you know, a lot of times people will be like, God, you're so close with your family. Like, you're so lucky. And I'm, I always feel like I work for that. You know, like I, I put emphasis and, and I, that's important to me. And I put effort and work on that. And I'm rewarded for it. Like I'm really close to them and that's because I put time in and I want it and I'm not close with outside relatives. Like I don't really have cousins or aunts and uncles that I have any kinds of real relationships with, you know, like I have, they're great people. I just don't see them or talk to them. And especially when I was younger, I really didn't get along with extended family. It was like really hard for me. And so I always would go to, okay, well, I have my immediate family. And so I'm going to focus on that because I do have that. And I'm, that's a good thing. I'm going to, I'm going to make good of that. And mm -hmm. that, that way it'll be okay that I don't really have the extended family. So. Um, okay. Let's talk about something lighter, but equally as important, our shared orthodontist. Oh my God. Dr. Silva. Yes. I forgot. Do She's you like see her at all? Anymore. I haven't seen her in a while because I stopped doing new trays for my Invisalign, but she's the best. And I, I think I told you this, like I, I went to, to like a thousand Invisalign consultations and she was by far the one she's the best. Yes. I remember, I think it came up like you have a thing about doctors and specifically about dentists, right? Like you were going to your people in Illinois, even though you lived here, which I related to a lot because I did that, although mine are in Orange County, so it's easier. But then I saw you posted something. This was years ago about Invisalign. And I'm like, oh, do you have a person? So then I started going to her. I never did Invisalign. I just I did the cheaper option, which are just retainers that like push your teeth back into place. Um, 
it, every time I went, it cracked me up because I was like the oldest person in the waiting room by yeah. 30 years. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. me and a bunch of kids, children. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then I got pregnant and I was like, well, I'm tired of feeling, of, I don't want to do anything that's going to make me more uncomfortable. So I just completely stopped everything. But I ran in and I felt like weird and guilty about, like, I just, I just, uh, I ghosted her. Not that she was well, coming she- after me. And she is, she loves you. She was, when I referred you, she was like, Esther, thank you so much. I'm such a big fan of hers. I like, she was your fan. Yeah, I know. That was like a fun surprise when she walked in and she's like, are you Alison Rosen? And I said, yes. That is so cool. (laughs) Yeah, uh, it was very, very sweet. And then I went, there was like a Burbank, what was it? A holiday street fair kind of thing and she had a booth because she's in Burbank now and I ran into her so it was really good to see her um and although I felt very self-conscious about my teeth to say like talking to her really yeah I did I felt like she but anyway so I'm going to go back one of these days so you haven't seen her in a while I haven't but I should also check in I also have like a dying tooth that I need to I need to to put on my face shield and get seen because I'm I think my tooth is dying and it's been dying for like a year. So I have all these problems. Do you have pain? It's really sensitive to cold and to heat and it's, it's a different color. And one of my friends has just started like coronavirus hooking up with a dentist and I made them (laughs) FaceTime me and she was like, well, if it's a different color and you're not geriatric, like you should be seen. It could be really serious. So what color is it? It's like, it's just like a little bit, uh, I don't know. It's like, oh, dim. wait, is it that the front, that front one? It's this one. Because it's hard to tell. Yeah. Oh, there's like food in it. <laughs> <laughs> huh. I, I don't see it. Things. I don't see a different color, but if it's, but you know what? I, I'm not, I'm no dentist. Have you had a dead tooth though? I have had root canal. I've had a root okay. canal. So I guess, I don't know that that's a dead tooth, but that's a, they make think, it a dead tooth. Right, right. Yeah. Have you ever had a root canal? No, but I think that's what this is going to be. Well, that's no fun. Is it, is it really, it's really bad, huh? Actually, you know what I found? Um, the way people use root canal to refer to like the worst thing in the world, it really wasn't like that. It was multiple appointments. I can't remember if it was two or more than two, but... So it's like not fun, but it wasn't actually painful. It's just someone fucking around in your mouth for a long time, which I don't like. Okay. The pain that I felt before having to get the root canal was like probably some of the worst pain I've ever felt in my life. But the actual oh. root canal was not so bad. So you but had the tooth pain ache- in your mouth and that's why you yeah. went in? Yes. Okay. It was, I mean, this is, it was when I was in college, but I would just woke up one morning and like my, my, whole side of my face hurt so bad and I just remember walking to class like holding my face and then I went I think that day because it was just like I couldn't I couldn't think it was and I've had I've been through labor now twice and I still feel like that might have been worse are you serious I think so I don't know about that but it was pretty it was pretty intense pretty intense let's talk about Esther Club tell me about Esther Club now I feel like I was in on the ground floor of the the non-virtual Esther club because you held an event and I went to it and I was listening back to an episode that you had been on and I was, I was like, okay, I've got to ask you a hard question. Now you had an Esther club and you invited people, but I, and I got an invitation, but I haven't received an invitation in so long. Did you take me off the list? And really I did. I asked you that like way before this whole Ellen DeGeneres, Dakota Johnson thing got popular. So do you know about that? No, I do not know all the details, but before all the Ellen news that's happening now, there was like something that had gone viral where, Dakota Johnson was on her sh- was on Ellen's show and Ellen was like like called her out in a sort of a joking way for not inviting Ellen to her birthday party or her Christmas party or something and then Dakota's like that's not true Ellen that's not true I did send you an invite and then that for that moment went viral Really I feel like I'm botch I'm I'm messing it up but it was something like that but anyway No Yeah No so I 
was had big ideas <laughs> that I was going to start an all women's social club. And of course, it was the most self-centered thing in the world called Esther Club. You had and buttons idea, made. I had buttons. The idea was this is all people that I think are badass that are like, do you know, and this was a long time ago. This yeah. I feel like this was before feminism was like cool. <laughs> it was like right before that. And I was like, all the girls that I think are cool, who are like doing their shit on their hustle. And so I invited like 25, 30 women and we all like hung out at, at a like restaurant patio and it was so much fun. And that was unfortunately the only Esther Club <laughs> event on record. Um, and I do remember there was like celebrities at the club, at the yes. bar. There, Amanda Seyfried was there. With- but wait, was, was she someone you had invited? No, but I did like oh. to fantasize that she was. <laughs> because she was then, and her, it wasn't Justin Long, her boyfriend yeah, at the time, and he was there too. Knew, they okay, knew they knew people some that people. that were Esther Club people. I don't remember who it was, but they were mingling with Esther Club members. So that is the first genesis of Esther Club. I wish I'd continued it. I still, I need to find a way to do that because I, nothing is more exciting to me than just like a group of women who are cool to me. Uh, <laughs> I have like a little sister complex or whatever. Like I'm always just trying to do that anyway. Um, so, but now that's the name of my podcast, which is right now in its current evolution is a solo podcast, kind of like thoughts and feelings, answering questions, little funny, weird segments, um, that I do. And that's on YouTube and then all the other places every week, every Tuesday. And you're also still doing glowing up, right? Yes, we brought Going Up back, and that's like a makeup-focused podcast. We just had Shay Mitchell on. It was so informative. <laughs> um, what happened when it went away? We were – Caroline was writing for – my co-host, Caroline Goldfarb. She runs the official Sean Penn like, meme account on Instagram. It's so funny. She – was writing for James Corden and I was shooting Dollface and we were both just like, and then right, right when she got done with James Corden, she was going away. And so we were just kind of like both burning the candle at both ends. And we're like, we need a hiatus. Let's pause. We'll regroup. And then when it came time to regroup, it just was a little harder to get it going. So we just kind of like let it go. And then as soon as the pandemic hit, we're like, what are we doing? We're at home all day. We don't have to drive to a studio to do this. And it just, we're so excited. We're like, this makes so much sense. So we brought it back. Um, okay. So I have a question because I was a guest on Glowing Up a while ago. And I don't know how it came up, but it came up that I had not had anal sex. And I still haven't. And sometimes I think to I'm myself. I'm so sorry. This, I'm so sorry. What, what did we do to you? <laughs> no, no, no. It's not the first time. It's, 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 it's one of the things that I, you know, it's in my arsenal of topics. Um, so, but sometimes I think, especially now that I'm this age, I'm like, am I going to go to the grave having never done acid? Am I going to go to the grave having never had anal sex? I don't know. But when I said, but honestly, I think I'm more curious about acid. But anyway, when I said I hadn't, you're like, what? Weren't you ever in high school? Which brings <laughs> me to my question, Esther, what was high school for you? What was it like for you? I don't know. You know, I don't know. I, I don't know what to say to that. I do. I did. <laughs> you know, you experiment. You're new to everything's so new. You're so much more excited. Everyone's everyone's trying alcohol for the first time. And I was just, you know, I had a boyfriend. I was like, whatever. But I think it's OK <laughs> if you if you don't try those things. I think it's OK. I sh- you shouldn't feel bad. Acid sounds... I'm not concerned about not doing acid. That sounds way too scary for me. What if I'm missing out on... No, you know what? No. I I'm mean, okay. Then what, you could think that about everything. You're like, I don't live in Paris. What am I missing out on? I don't know. Yeah. So it's fine. Nah, I guess you're right. Uh, so tell me about your tie-dye endeavors. Yeah. So I... Uh, have nothing to do. (laughs) I am a stand-up comedian and that is, that industry is gone for a long time. And so, and I also have a, like 
a really serious anxiety disorder or something like that that I kind of discovered this year. And I'm really learning that I need hobbies and I need activities and I need self-care and I need uh, interests and all these things that I hadn't really put effort into before. And so everyone was kind of tie-dying on social media like at the beginning of this pandemic and I just like bought a bunch of stuff and started doing it and got so, so addicted. And it feels really meditative for me. And I was like spending all this money on blank t-shirts and different colors and bins and everything. And um, I just, and then some of my like listeners were like, will you ever sell this tie-dye? And I was like, oh yeah, I will. And so then I launched a tie-dye web store called Sleepover by Esther. And I'm obviously, uh, you know, I'm just one person. I, I'm, I'm like, here's how smart I am. I made a clothing line where I have to handle literally every aspect of it by hand. I'm like, not the most scalable business. <laughs> so it's very slow. You know, I usually can drop like 50 shirts um, every like three to four weeks. And, you know, they and uh, so I'll kind of do that system. But I am transferring over to I've like I'm. I'm like, fuck it. I'm launching a clothing line. So I've been working with a factory and developing my designs and my styles and everything. And so I'm hoping by like late September, I'll be able to launch like this real fantasy of mine, which is like my tagline is like, look like a celebrity that just landed at LAX. Because <laughs> that's my style. It's yeah. like a little bit elevated, like comfy, you know, like swe a sweatsuit you could wear to work or something that's kind of my that's at least my style so I'm excited I'll, I'll probably lose a lot of money doing it but I'm fine with that at this like that's fine it's, who cares the world is burning <laughs> that's exciting though um in terms of that and I read an article uh about your special where they said that that your fiance described your style as celebrity at the airport which I thought was very funny. Um, for you, is it a thing of like you need to be comfortable or is it like these are the clothes that you like best? I've always just worn sweatpants and T-shirts and hoodies. Like, I don't know. Sometimes I'm like, does my stomach hurt more than everyone else's? Like, why can't everyone just easily throw on jeans and I like refuse to do it? I, like, mm -hmm. I'm like, do I need to get that checked out? But I've just always been into comfy loungewear. I, I've never worn heels. I always wear sneakers. Like, I'm a very... Um, like I love a bralette. I don't like a push up bra. I just, I, I don't know. I like to be comfy, cozy. I, I, I don't know. Are, are you like that? Like, how do you feel about that? Um, I, at home, I don't even like the first thing I do when I get home. And I, by the way, I've been only home for, you know, for the last many months, but the first thing I do is take off a bra. Um, yes. and I am pretty much always in, in, lounge pants or sweatpants. Um, and I feel like as I've gotten older, I really have pushed it uh, to see like, how much can I just basically wear pajamas in public? Yeah. But I wouldn't say that's my style. For me, it's mm -hmm. more like it's because I, I just don't care. I feel like I spent so many years caring so much about how I looked and like not being able to leave the house unless I spent four hours doing my hair and, and like I just don't want to do that anymore <laughs> but it's turned yeah. into almost an antisocial thing where I'm like I'm like exacting revenge on society by looking like shit which really is like kind of crazy I I see that I get what you're saying. You're like, you want to be comfortable, but your actual taste and style is different than just loungewear. That's, yes. that's an interesting, I'm glad you're making that distinction. Cause right. Like for me, my taste and style is like cute, flattering sweats and t-shirt. Like that is what I like. I'm into it. Whenever I see a woman dressed like that, I'm like, yes, yes. More of that, more of that. Like I love that look on people. Mm -hmm. And I also like, my mom told me that when I would get home from kindergarten, the first thing I would do when I stepped in the house is strip naked and take all my clothes <laughs> off. Like there's something about like outside world clothes that I just like want to rip off my body and get into the comfies. Yes. So I think, I don't know what, that's just always been my, my desire. Yes. I remember when I was dating my then boyfriend, now husband, <clears throat> Daniel, and it was like our, our, was it our first Valentine's day? 
maybe. And he had made dinner and it was very sweet. And I, and I was on the Adam Carolla show at the time. And so I would get to his house after the show, which was like 1030. Um, and I would, you know, have my overnight bag and I, PM? yeah, cause we recorded in those days we recorded in the evening. Okay. Um, and I was living, I had just moved back from New York and so I was still living in Orange County, California. Uh, so I would commute, but I started, so, but like once it started getting serious between him and me, I'm realizing actually maybe I was already, I was living in Hollywood at that point. That part, it doesn't, it not important. Um, the point being, I would just get to his house late and I would like instantly change into comfortable clothes from my uncomfortable work clothes. And I remember I got there and I was like, I'm going to go change. And he's like, you know, oh, why don't you wait? Like, why don't we, you know, have dinner dressed like (laughs) before you become like a sweats monster. And I remember sitting there with my bra still on and I almost began to have claustrophobia of like, (gasps) no, you don't understand. I cannot relax with this bra on. I had a whole internal meltdown, but I didn't, I didn't feel comfortable enough to like have an external meltdown or talk to him about it. So I just sat there uncomfortably. Like, if you love me, you will let me change. Wait, that is so weird. How early in the relationship was it? Well, I'm wondering if I'm, so if it was Valentine's day, then it was like, like eight months in or something. So it wasn't that early. But if it wasn't Valentine's Day, then I don't know. My memory is that it was pretty early in our relationship. Wow. That's really interesting. I re- I'm remembering like early my relationship. The first night I went over to hang out at his place, I showed up in my comfy clothes. Uh huh. Like I felt, I don't know, like, cause I'm with you. I can't relax in the work uniform. Right. <gasps> yeah. I can't. It's- it's like a whole thing of having to like take all that off and then take my makeup off and yeah, the jeans are just like yeah, no can do digging yeah. So I'm on Patreon, patreoncom slash Rosen, and I take questions there. And uh, some of the Patreon people have some questions for you. So let's get into that, and we have a little song. When we ask, they send them in, they're wondering how you have been. So thanks so much for answering these questions from our fans. Okay, Lisa Lowry wants to know, what are the contents in and or on her nightstand? Okay, well, I don't currently have a nightstand because my life is a mess. But I have a very crowded bathroom vanity that I have just, I, do, I like to destroy everything that I own. I, in the room that I'm in right now is my office and I, I bought every single piece of furniture. Um, and so when my fiance comes in this room and sees like a, a ring on my coffee table or like a sticker on my bookshelf. I'm like, <laughs> it's mine. I bought it. I'm going to destroy it as I please <laughs> because I was just raised like, so everything has to be clean and perfect. And so mm-hmm. I love to destroy things anyway on my, my, uh, what well, would be on my nightstand. So wait, I you have, have ne- do you not, do you not have bedside tables? I don't, I'm currently sleeping in the guest room because I'm just in a weird habit of sleeping in there. And so there's no nightstand in there. But I will put... I need water at the side of the bed. I usually have my phone. I have a tissue box. Because I blow my nose all the time. Um, not because I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> I just have really bad allergies. <laughs> um, there's always like eight scrunchies in the corner of my bed because I always take my scrunchie off right before bed. And then I'm every like seven days. I'm like, where are all my scrunchies? I have this problem too. Yes. (laughs) Uh, There's uh, currently, I have a headband, my prized headband that I use for washing my face and I cannot fucking find it. Oh, I I know that feeling. I lose everything, but it always turns up. Yeah. Um, It's somewhere. And then anything else in my, 
uh, my it, theoretical bed stand, which is just the corner of my bed or the side <laughs> of the bed, which is so I have to live like shit or I can't feel safe. Uh, <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So you're sleeping in the guest room. Do you guys not sleep in the same room? We do, but he has a really crazy sleep schedule. And I need to sleep with like a blasting TV show or podcast. And so I'm just kind of in that zone and I, we haven't like adjusted yet. It's not, this is this weird thing where people are like, oh my God, they're sleeping separate. What does it mean? And then I get so many, write it. Like I get so many messages from my listeners that are like, oh, will you talk more about this? We sleep separate. People yeah. Think it's crazy. But yeah, we, we sleep together a lot of the time and then sometimes we sleep separate. It's what, like, I don't care except I I don't think yeah. it's crazy. My other podcast, Childish with Greg Fitzsimmons, that's our parenting-ish podcast. We've had people write in saying they sleep in separate rooms. And with Owen, that's my second baby, when, um, when at the beginning, when he was younger, at not, instead of having him in our room, we just started him in a crib from the beginning. But Daniel would sleep in, he was, there's a bed in his room and Daniel would sleep in there. So we were sleeping separately then. And honestly, I was sleeping better because he snores and I'm a super light sleeper. So Dave has I, sleep I get apnea. It. He has a breathing machine. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I, I do sometimes sleep better without it. But <laughs> I also, I love, there's something that just gets me off about sleeping in different rooms than the room that you're supposed to sleep in. Like my, sometimes I'll make it, I'll be like, Dave, it's a holiday weekend. Let's get our blankets and go into the living room and sleep on the couch tonight. It's just like, oh, I really, why do we have beds for this? <laughs> why do we have a bed? And I, sometimes I'll get him to do it with me, and it's so much fun. I like, I'll met him just like, we're sleeping in the couch. It's so fun. <laughs> um, yeah, I keep thinking, I keep thinking we should have, like, we should camp out with my kids in the living room, or actually, there was at one point talk of getting a tent and doing it outside. We haven't done this yet, but I can see oh, where that would be fun. So fun. I meant to ask you, I remembered what it was that had slipped my mind. You, you said that recently you've uh, realized you have a significant anxiety disorder. So what's been going on? Yeah, I just realized in January of this year that I, I, the way my brain is, is not normal. You know, I have a lot of anxiety um, and it can really spiral me out. And for some, for whatever reason, it just came to a like full, I don't know, just got really bad in January and I, it might have something to do with like you know in 2019 I was really busy with Dollface and I was really really busy with shooting my special and then those things kind of ended at the end of the year and I was just kind of left with nothing and I didn't like I said I didn't have hobbies I didn't have outside interests I didn't know what to do with myself and on top of all that like I had just achieved these really big goals of mine and didn't feel any different and didn't feel like my mm. problems were solved and um so I just was like flailing through life and I was crying, which I, I'm not a crier. Like I don't cry. And all of a sudden in January, I'm like crying every day, like of with anxious feelings. And I ultimately decided to go on Lexapro and, um, obviously do a lot of other work to get better, but I'm doing a lot better now. And I also think in January, I was already really scared of this pandemic and I think the combination of what I was dealing with and then plus like feeling afraid of the outside world, it just, I was not going to fix this on my own. And so yeah. I'm doing so much better. Oh, good. I'm like, what, like now that I'm on Lexapro, I'm just like, oh, I'm, this was, my brain needed this. This is, this is for me. This works. So. I'm on it as well. And I've you had are. a similar. Yes, I am. Oh, I, how? my whole life, I was always like, I don't need that. I just need talk therapy. I'm, and I was afraid of antidepressants and I was afraid it would change me. Um, even though one by one, like everyone around me went on something and felt like it helped them so much. And then the postpartum depression that I had after I had my first kid, I was like, similar kind of similar to what you're saying I was just like okay this is like whatever's happening in my brain this is not how it's supposed to be like and I'm willing to like I'll do anything to feel better and so I went on how, it and been on it since how long have you been on it so that was 20 
17. So three years. Did you have to go off it for your second baby? No, I wanted to. I got to a point where I was like, and I feel like this is like textbook antidepressant stuff where I'm like, I'm doing so much better. I don't think I need it anymore. Like, I'm pretty sure I don't need it. Um, And so when I was like gearing up to get pregnant with my second, every doctor was like, you're not going to go off of it, right? (laughs) Like, you can stay on it. And I'm like... I was like, why does everyone like why does, why does everyone feel so strongly that it would behoove me to stay on it? But I tapered. I decided I'm going to try to go off of it. So I tapered down, and I I, I was doing fine. And then I got to 2.5, which is like the tiniest little dose, and I started feeling depressed again. And I started feeling really? anxious, and it was a, really a mind fuck because I didn't know is this like the old me coming back or is this a response to withdrawal? Whatever it is, I don't want to stick around. I don't want to find out. So I just went up to up to five and I was on five for a long time. And then I like slowly have gotten now I'm back on 10. Wow. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. I have to say I have no interest in going off it. I'm sure that might, you know, that could always change, but I'm the thought of going off it is like, really scary to me actually yeah well that's yeah. good Pro- i mean and not that it's good or bad but that's better than what i was dealing with which is like i'm pretty sure i don't need this and i don't well, know that that's true can i ask you like yeah i kind of don't understand what is postpartum depression what is that what is that uh- I also didn't understand before I experienced it. I, because I had read, you know, People Magazine about whatever her name is, Susan, who had like, like mothers who harmed their kids. I thought it was this like psychosis that happens over some sadness of the baby being outside your body or something. Really all it is, is depression or anxiety experienced after you have a child. It's, it's not in relation to the child, really. It's more just like, chronologically it happens after you have a baby um so for me what it was and I had a traumatic birth with Elliot and I think that that caused it um that in addition to just the adjustment to becoming a mother but I just started having a lot of dark intrusive thoughts not about harming my baby but just I just felt like the world is a very scary cruel place and it's just a matter of time before something awful happens to us and I was crying all the time and I felt very alone and I would just, just constantly get these like flashes of, of him hurt, not me hurting him, but him hurting himself, like just how fragile he is and how yes. delicate he is and how fragile and delicate everything in the world is. Yeah. Um, and I just, at a certain point was just like this, this shouldn't be the on a loop in my mind it's all this just darkness i mean yes the world is dark and scary and sad but i don't need to be thinking about it exclusively 24 hours a day exactly yeah for me going on it was like it did it has not changed who i am it has not made my problems go away it's just made that like panicky feeling when i get scared or anxious i don't get that as bad right it would no that go ahead I was just going to say, it was explained to me by by someone as like, it's sort of like taking aspirin for a headache. Like, it doesn't change who you are. It just makes the headache go away. Like, it just kind of makes, and it doesn't entirely, but it makes the depression go away. And yeah, you're more that, yourself. That's interesting, explaining postpartum that way. That makes a lot of sense. Like, I feel like that would be a really scary thing to I just feel like having a child seems like you you put yourself in such a vulnerable position. Yeah. To like have so much feelings and care for this thing. Yeah, I that makes sense. I could <laughs> I could see how that happens. Um all right, Ashley Brent says, "Yes, I'm so excited. I love her. Can she tell the bachelor party story now that her incredible now that her incredibly hilarious special is out?" And I'm not sure oh what this gosh. is a reference to. So I I won't tell the full story. I will try to tell that on Esther Club, though. I It's hard to tell the story because I did it as a bit for so long that, like, it's just kind of all mixed up in my head. But basically the gist of it is I went to my fiancé's bachelor party 
Um, I flew to Vegas secretly and surprised him, and it was not a good idea. Uh, <laughs> no one was happy to see me, and it caused a huge fight. Uh, and I, I talk. There's a bit. It, I think I think it's only in the extended cut of my special, mm-hmm. which is the one that's on CC.com. So you can see the bit on it there. But that is something I did, and I, I promise to go into more detail on Esther Club. But I don't. Okay. Want to bore, I don't want to bore you. I don't think you would bore me, but we do have more questions. Megan Parker, what skincare products is she loving right now? Okay, great question. I love the F Balm hydrating mask that I just use as a moisturizer from Drunk Elephant. I really like the Drunk Elephant Gentle Face Wash as well as the Ose O S E A Milk Ocean Cleanser. My whole thing right now is I just need a gentle face cleanser and then something super hydrating. And I kind of will switch up what the hydration is, but usually like a heavy, like a face oil, um, something from, what do I have? I just am experimenting with the Vintner's Daughter Serum, which is super pricey and I don't recommend yet. But um, Whitney Cummings gave me a a half used bottle of it. So I'm, you know, worshiping it. But I think headline is like gentle cleanse and hydration. And then during the day, I mix a CC cream that has SPF with a little bit of a moisturizer. And that is working so good for me. That's like I found my groove. I got like a tinted sunscreen hydration in the morning. Whitney C says, what's your relaxation routine? Relaxation routine. Definitely need one. I... (laughs) I have this like little bucket of skincare tools that I try to keep right on my couch with me where I do sit all day. And I have uh, one of these jade rollers. Oh, yeah. So I'll just like rub that into my around my jaw, my cheeks. And then I have these freezer tools that look really weird. And it's just like cold. And I'll try to rub that on my face. And then I also have the gua sha ceramic tool somewhere around here I was just using that so I just try to like I get a lot of really bad headaches that come from like neck pains Mm -hmm. so and jaw and grinding my teeth so I just am always trying to rub and like give care generous care to my face muscles (laughs) and lastly Lauren Kelly what got her started on doing tie-dye we already answered that but does she have any tips for a beginner her shirts are beautiful Thank you. That is so nice. Um, Tips would be like really think, really sit and be thoughtful about your color combinations. And when you tie them up, sometimes I notice a beginner's mistake will be like to just get to leave a lot of white and like just put color in like little dots or strips. But I like to really saturate the color. But once it's tied up, because there'll still be a lot of white left over. Um, so I like to, I like to go crazy with the colors, go heavy with the colors and and also just be specific about the colors you choose. Esther, thank you so much. I feel like we need like another hour to just catch up because I feel like there's so much more to talk about with you. I know. And I will, I, you're the easiest, best person to talk to. It is crazy. you. You just continue to be so easy and fun and I will always come and talk to you. This is, thank you for having me. Okay. Let's, let's just, let's do that then. Let's plan whether it's another episode or just another, like you and me talking and catching up. Um, tell everyone where they can find you and plug everything you'd like to plug. Yeah, so my solo podcast, Esther Club, comes out every Tuesday, and I would absolutely love for people to check it out. I have a few episodes that I just put out that are my tips for self building self-esteem and self-worth and uh, what else? Self, Just like self-love and bullshit like that. But don't worry, I don't make it cheesy. And then <laughs> my stand-up special is uh, streaming for free on Comedy Central's website, cc.com. So you can watch that, no login, just totally free uh, 40 minutes of, of, of craziness. Wonderful. And please follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Allison Rosen. Listen to my other podcast, Childish. If you like what you're hearing and on both podcasts, subscribe, rate, review. It helps out the show. Uh, you can watch these episodes on youtube.com slash Allison Rosen. Subscribe to me over there. And I'm on Patreon, patreon.com slash Allison Rosen and cameo, cameo.com slash Allison Rosen. Esther, thank you so much. Listeners, thank you for listening. I love you. Goodbye. Hey, do you know about the Alice and Rosen show? We had a good time, but now we got. 
gotta go. 